It was a rainy afternoon in the quiet English village of Willowbrook. The sky was a blanket of gray, and the soft patter of rain against the window pane set a melancholy tone. Emily Harris, a 17-year-old girl with auburn hair and freckles scattered across her nose, sat by her bedroom window, staring out at the house across the street. It belonged to the Millers, an elderly couple who had always been a bit odd, but lately their behavior had taken a turn for the sinister. The Millers' house was an old Victorian with ivy crawling up its stone walls. The windows were always closed, and heavy drapes kept the interior hidden from prying eyes. Emily had often wondered what lay behind those drapes, but she had never been brave enough to find out. That changed when she saw something that made her blood run cold. One evening, while Emily was doing her homework, she glanced out the window and saw Mr. Miller standing in his front garden. He was a tall, gaunt man, with a pale complexion and hollow eyes. He seemed to be staring directly at her, though it was hard to tell from the distance. Emily shivered and quickly looked away, but curiosity got the better of her. She peeked through the curtains again and saw him still standing there, his eyes fixed on her. The next day at school, Emily couldn't shake the feeling of unease. She told her best friend Sarah about Mr. Miller's creepy stare. Sarah, always up for a bit of adventure, suggested they investigate. Let's check it out tonight, she said with a mischievous grin. Emily hesitated but eventually agreed. That night, armed with flashlights and their phones, Emily and Sarah snuck out of Emily's house and crept across the street. The rain had stopped, but the ground was still wet, and the air was damp and chilly. They approached the Miller's house cautiously, their footsteps barely making a sound on the wet grass. As they neared the house, they heard a faint, eerie melody coming from within. It was an old lullaby, haunting and sad. Emily's heart raced as they reached the front door. It was slightly ajar, and she exchanged a nervous glance with Sarah before pushing it open. The door creaked loudly, and the melody grew louder, echoing through the dimly lit hallway. The girls stepped inside, their flashlights casting long flickering shadows on the walls. The air was thick with the scent of damp wood and something else, something metallic. Emily's stomach churned as they moved further into the house. The source of the music seemed to be coming from the living room. They tiptoed towards the sound, their hearts pounding in their chests. When they reached the living room, they saw Mrs. Miller sitting in an old rocking chair, her back to them. She was humming the lullaby, her voice soft and raspy. On the floor in front of her were several dolls, their eyes blank and lifeless. The scene was unsettling, but what truly terrified Emily was the sight of Mr. Miller standing in the corner, his eyes once again fixed on her. Suddenly, Mrs. Miller stopped humming and turned her head slowly towards the girls. Her eyes were milky white, and her face was gaunt and hollow. "'We've been expecting you,' she croaked, a sinister smile spreading across her face. Emily and Sarah turned to run, but the front door slammed shut, trapping them inside. Mr. Miller stepped forward, his movements slow and deliberate. "'You shouldn't have come here,' he whispered, his voice cold and menacing. Panic set in as the girls realized they were trapped. They backed away, their flashlights flickering wildly. Emily's mind raced, trying to find a way out. We need to find another exit, she whispered to Sarah, who nodded, her face pale with fear. They bolted down the hallway, searching for a back door or a window they could escape through. The house seemed to stretch endlessly, with dark, twisting corridors that led to nowhere. The eerie melody resumed, growing louder and more frantic, as if the house itself was alive and taunting them. Finally, they stumbled upon a staircase leading to the basement. It was their only option. They hurried down the steps, the air growing colder and more oppressive with each step. The basement was a maze of old furniture, cobwebs, and dusty relics. In the corner, they spotted a small window. It was their way out. Sarah climbed onto a stack of boxes and began prying the window open. Emily kept watch, her eyes darting around the dark room. Just as Sarah managed to open the window, they heard footsteps descending the stairs. Mr. Miller's shadow loomed over them, and Emily's heart sank. Go, Sarah, go, Emily urged, helping her friend through the narrow opening. Sarah squeezed through and dropped to the ground outside. Emily followed, struggling to fit through the small space. She could hear Mr. Miller getting closer, his breath heavy and labored. Just as Emily pulled herself through the window, Mr. Miller's hand grasped her ankle, 
She screamed and kicked, freeing herself from his grip. She tumbled to the ground outside, scrambling to her feet. Sarah grabbed her hand, and they ran as fast as they could, not daring to look back. They didn't stop until they reached Emily's house, slamming the door behind them. Gasping for breath, they collapsed on the floor, their hearts still racing. Emily's parents, alarmed by the noise, rushed downstairs. What happened? Her mother asked, worry etched on her face. Emily and Sarah exchanged a glance, deciding not to tell the whole truth. We just had a bit of an adventure, Emily said, forcing a smile. But we're okay. That night, as Emily lay in bed, she couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. She glanced out the window and saw the Miller's house, dark and foreboding. She knew they had narrowly escaped something truly sinister, and she vowed never to go near that house again. But the memory of the Miller's eerie eyes and the haunting melody would stay with her forever. The village of Ashford had always been a quiet and peaceful place. Nestled in the English countryside, it was the kind of village where everyone knew everyone else. But when the Peterson family moved into the old stone house at the end of Oak Street, things began to change. I first noticed something was off one rainy autumn afternoon. I was sitting in my bedroom, trying to focus on my homework, when I saw Mrs. Peterson standing in their garden. She was an older woman with long gray hair and piercing blue eyes. She was just standing there, staring at our house. It gave me the creeps. The Peterson house was old and grand, with ivy creeping up the walls and a large iron gate that always seemed to be slightly ajar. The windows were covered with thick curtains and it was rare to see any lights on inside. Mr. Peterson was a tall, thin man with a gaunt face and deep-set eyes. He rarely spoke to anyone, and when he did, it was in a low, almost whispering voice. My parents always told me to stay away from the Petersons. They said the family was strange and that it was best not to get involved. But curiosity got the better of me. One evening, my best friend Sarah and I decided to find out more about our creepy neighbors. We waited until nightfall, then snuck out of my house and made our way to the Petersons. The rain had stopped, but the ground was still wet and muddy. We crept through the garden, our hearts pounding in our chests. As we approached the house, we heard strange, whispering voices coming from inside. Sarah and I exchanged nervous glances but pressed on. We found a small, broken window at the back of the house and carefully climbed through. Inside, the house was dark and cold, with a musty smell that made me want to gag. The whispering voices grew louder, echoing through the empty rooms. We followed the sound to a large, dimly lit room at the end of the hallway. There, we saw the Petersons gathered around a table holding hands and chanting in a language I didn't recognize. In the center of the table was an old, tattered book with strange symbols on the cover. The air was thick with tension and I could feel my skin prickling with fear. Suddenly, Mrs. Peterson's head snapped up and her piercing blue eyes locked onto mine. We've been expecting you, she said in a voice that sent shivers down my spine. Sarah and I turned to run, but the door slammed shut behind us. Mr. Peterson stood in the doorway, blocking our escape. You shouldn't have come here, he said, his voice cold and menacing. Panic set in as we realized we were trapped. We backed away, our hearts racing. The Petersons began to chant louder, their voices rising to a fever pitch. The room seemed to close in around us, and I felt a crushing weight on my chest. Just when I thought we were done for, there was a loud crash from the hallway. The chanting stopped abruptly and the Petersons looked towards the sound, their faces pale with fear. Seizing the opportunity, Sarah and I bolted for the door, pushing past Mr. Peterson and sprinting down the hallway. We didn't stop running until we were safely back at my house. My parents were waiting for us, their faces filled with worry. We told them everything and they immediately called the police. The next day, the Peterson house was empty. The family had vanished without a trace, leaving behind only the strange, tattered book. The police searched the house but found nothing. The villagers whispered about dark rituals and cursed families, and the house at the end of Oak Street was soon abandoned, left to decay, and be swallowed by the creeping ivy. Years later, the memory of that night still haunts me. The Petersons were gone, but the fear they left behind lingered in Ashford, a dark shadow over our once peaceful village.
In the small fog-covered village of Whittlesford, there was an eerie calm that settled over the cobblestone streets every night. The village was quaint, with old stone houses lined up neatly along narrow lanes. It was the kind of place where everyone knew each other, and news traveled fast. But when the old Harrington house finally found new occupants, whispers of unease spread like wildfire. The house itself was a looming dark structure at the end of Hawthorne Lane, with ivy creeping up its weathered walls and broken windows peering out like empty eyes. For years it had stood abandoned, a monument to forgotten times and ghostly memories. That is, until the Clarks moved in. Mr. and Mrs. Clark were an odd couple. Mr. Clark was tall and thin, with a perpetually stern expression. His skin was pale, almost as if he had never seen the sun. Mrs. Clark was small and frail, with wild, unkempt hair and eyes that darted around nervously. They had a son, Oliver, who was about my age. He rarely spoke, and had an unsettling habit of staring at people without blinking. One foggy evening, as I was walking home from my friend Lucy's house, I noticed Oliver standing at the edge of their property, just staring. His eyes seemed to follow me, and a chill ran down my spine. I hurried past, not daring to look back, but curiosity got the better of me. The next day I decided to find out more about the Clarks. Lucy and I made a plan to investigate. We waited until dusk, when the village was cloaked in shadows and the fog began to roll in. We crept through the overgrown garden of the Harrington house, our footsteps muffled by the thick mist. The air was heavy with an earthy scent, and the silence was broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves. We found a small, dirty window at the side of the house and peered inside. The room was dimly lit, with flickering candles casting long, dancing shadows on the walls. There was a large table in the center, covered with strange objects, old books, jars filled with unidentifiable substances, and what looked like ancient artifacts. The Clarks were gathered around it, whispering in hushed tones. Suddenly, Mrs. Clark's head snapped up, and her eyes met mine. "'Who's there?' she called out, her voice sharp and cold. Lucy and I ducked down, our hearts pounding in our chests. We had to get out of there. We turned to leave, but as we did, we heard a low growl. Out of the shadows stepped a large black dog with glowing red eyes. It bared its teeth and started to advance towards us. We backed away slowly, but the dog lunged, and we took off running. We didn't stop until we were back at my house, breathless and terrified. My parents were waiting, their faces etched with worry. We told them everything, but they dismissed it as our overactive imaginations. But the strange occurrences didn't stop there. Over the next few weeks, we noticed odd things happening around the village. Pets went missing, and strange symbols began to appear on doors and walls. The villagers were on edge, and the Clarks remained as mysterious and unsettling as ever. One night, I woke up to the sound of scratching at my window. I pulled back the curtain to see Oliver standing outside, his face pale and eyes wide with fear. Help me, he whispered. They're not my real parents. The next morning, the Clarks were gone. The house stood empty once more, and the villagers breathed a collective sigh of relief. But the eerie feeling lingered, and whispers of dark rituals and otherworldly beings continued to haunt Whittlesford. The Harrington House remained a dark, foreboding presence, a reminder of the chilling events that had unfolded there. And as for me, I couldn't shake the feeling that we hadn't seen the last of the Clarks.